Call to order the Public Improvement Commission hearing of December 8, 2016. Public hearing item number one on a petition of GEGC to New Street uh, LLC for the vertical discontinuance of a portion of New Street, a public way, East Boston, located on the northwesterly side of generally northeast of Sumner Street, vertically above the grade of the sidewalk it was new business on November 17th, 2016. As shown on a plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division Discontinuance Plan Vertical New Street East Boston One Sheet dated October 25th, 2016. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. My name is John Schmidt uh, from Ditch Engineering, and I'm here representing GEGC2 New Street LLC. As we discussed it in business, this project is completed and functioning, um, but during the post construction ALTA survey, we identified a small component of the building that encroaches into the public way. That encroachment is approximately seven square feet, uh, about four inches into the public way and about two and a half feet wide. It's essentially this area right here. Um, really, the, in conversations with uh, Gary Moshe and with Amy, according the city, essentially thought it was a minimus, but we are actually going through this process in order to keep, keep the title clear. Um, so the project can be transferred in the future. John, is the petition in here today? Is uh, the petition no, in here? And no, we have something in writing? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Any comments? The, the purpose of this is for a canopy? No, it's, no. it's a small projection here. So we, we, we just need to do this piece here. It's 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 around this one. Okay. So this is basically how it's Amy or Todd, any comments? Yeah. yeah. Any comments from the audience? All right. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the petition by GEGC2 New Street LLC for vertical discontinuance of a portion of New Street as described and rendered to the record by the chair, as shown in the plan entitled City of Boston Public Works Department Engineering Division, a discontinuance plan on New Street East Boston. The one sheet is dated October 25th, 2016. Second. All in favor? Aye. So moved. Thank you very much. All right, the first item of new business uh, is uh, Bennington Street at Layden Street in East Boston, a square dedication on a petition by the neighborhood of Butters. Joe. Good morning, Chief. My name is Joseph Ruggiero. I'm a uh, resident of Orion Heights, East Boston. Uh, the residents have a petition to the city to move forward with uh, a square dedication for Alfred Buddy Mangini, a longtime community activist, chairman um, of over 25 years of the East Boston Columbus Day Parade, um, past president of East Boston Chamber of Commerce, Kiwanis Club, Key Club, a uh, very active um, member of the East Boston community and a staple um, to the neighborhood that has dedicated the last 60, 70 years of his life to making East Boston a better place, and the neighbors just wanted to show their appreciation for Buddy by naming this dedication. Commission. Um, is this currently uh, dedicated to a veteran killed in action, this square? Uh, we have, uh, it's kind of an offset intersection. We have a veteran at the other one, but we allow for square dedications and veterans dedications at the same intersection, just opposite corners. I'd like to have this, this run by the Veterans Commission. Absolutely. I definitely don't want to lessen any, you know, sacrifice at that yeah, individual. Yeah, so this is a, a traffic island that currently has no dedications in it right now. Right, but I'm, I'm talking yep. about the yep. intersection Absolutely. as it's listed in the street directory. Absolutely. All right. Any further comments? No. I, I, I just want, is the gentleman still alive? I, yes. Okay. Amy, do we have a support latest from the city council or the area? Yes, we do. We have. And I have a picture of the intersection here. Joe, will two weeks be enough time to come back? Yeah, sorry. All right, we'll see you on the public hearing on December 22nd. All right, thank you very much. All right, the second item of new business, uh, it's 130-140 Western Ave, Stadium Road, Academic Way, Science Drive, and Brighton. The winding, relocation, and extension, layout approvals, pedestrian easements, and specific repairs on a set of joint petitions by the President and Fellows of Harvard College and Harvard Real Estate, Paulson Inc. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. I'm Peter Kohansky from Goulston and Stores. I'm here on behalf of 
Harvard University for this new business matter. Um, Harvard has, uh, so I'm joined by Joe Began of Harvard University, he's the senior manager of transportation. Mark Younghands and Mike Regan from VHB are here, they're the project engineers. Harvard has submitted um, five petitions, all relating to work to the public realm um, in and around Western Avenue in connection with the construction of the science and engineering complex building. The petitions, there are, there are five of them. Three of them relate to the layout of private ways open to public travel um, in the vicinity uh, uh, around the site and then an extension of what will be Academic Way on the other side of Western Avenue. The other two petitions are requesting approval for specific repairs for public realm improvements along Western Avenue on both sides and pedestrian easements on both sides to allow the, the proper width of sidewalk to accommodate the, the public realm improvements. So I will turn it over to Joe, who will give you a little overview of the project and, and Harvard's IMP context, and then we'll turn it over to Mark for the plans.
this roadway system will also carry a lot of these utilities that will be long term plan. So the first uh, improvements that we have in front of you, I'm going to use the illustrative plan because I think for right now it's easier, uh, is uh, a suite of improvements to Western Avenue. The science building um, is improving really the frontage along Western Avenue from about 114 Western all the way back to Travis Street. And these improvements include um, off-road bike lanes, uh, widened sidewalks, landscaping, lighting, uh, a complete um, update of what's out there now. And to accommodate all these additional components within the width, it doesn't fit in the width of uh, Western Avenue. So along with the specific repair approval that we're requesting for Western Avenue, we're also proposing pedestrian easements on either side to provide the appropriate width. There were some places where we had utility conflicts on the north side of Western Avenue which kind of pushed the tree line back and the um, light pole line back because there are the rise in power conduits and then right on the curb there is a 48 inch um, distributor water main with a 60 inch sleeve that we can't get too close to. So some of those things that we've been working with the uh, lighting department in Boston Water and Sewer and Verizon on had shaped the design. We've um, met with the off Mayor's Office on Disabilities, um, and they made some changes to the plan, which you know, made it better, changes in crosswalks, changes in curb ramps, changes in sidewalk widths. They pushed on us a bit about you know, the size of the landscaped areas, and we had to provide additional detail and sections to um, satisfy them why we're doing what we're doing. Um, this has been through a, a process with BTD, we're actually um, passed a 75% design submission and moving toward a 100% design submission for the improvements in West Avenue and the new road layouts. And that's something that's been going on since early this year. So that's just an iterative process that includes a new signal at this intersection because when this building is constructed, this corner will become a very important link into the campus. So we'll have a lot of pedestrians crossing here, shuttle bus activity, all kinds of things right here. Uh, and it's all coordinated with the improvements that were originally done in various corner land. So the first two actions are specific repair and pedestrian easements in West Manor. And the next set of actions will lead to... Yes, I'm sorry. Give us some time. So your pedestrian easements, let's start with that. How does it transition beyond your project request? You are looking for a pedestrian easement, how do they transition? And also advise the commission members as to who the immediate abutters are. So that way you have some sense of a uniform cross-section within the sidewalk space. We try to find logical spots for the pedestrian easements to uh, transition out. Um, the science building is right here. I, I hope you guys have a plan up here. The science building is here in this section, here in this section. On the working from the west to the east, we only needed a, a 1.2 feet to get the uh, width, the, um, the six foot width of the um, accessibility commission down here. So we just provided the east, so there's, it essentially just ends in Travis Street. And then through the intersection, we made, made a change in width, where along the front of the building is where we have some of the wider landscaped areas and the off street bicycle path and that sort of thing. That's driving the width. And so that pedestrian easement transitions at the academic green intersection on both the north and the south sides of the streets, carries along the front of the building, and then on Stadium Way, uh, it continues across Stadium Way, and it ends by 114 Western Avenue. Who is that 114 Western Avenue? Yes. This looks abrupt. Yes. That's because we're still working with the BPDA um, and developing the design for 114 Western Avenue, and we'll be back when that design is complete, let's say in about six months' time, extending this uh, improvement scenario all the way down to Hague Street. That's what. Yes. So that's something that's in, I should have brought that up for us, something we're still working on, and that'll complete the picture here from an access point of view. That will be in front of you and approved before we start construction on the road, so it will all be built as at once. The reason that we're seeking these approvals, and we say, well, I 
wouldn't you wait six months for the whole thing? Because we need these approvals in place to support the building permit for the SEC. And why is that? We need to address. We need an address that we need, uh, we need public improvement commission support because we're proposing what the public street. So ISD is going to want us to. But the building, we've already started that, right? Well, it was started back in 2006, yep. 2008, and it was stopped. So okay. what, what changes, though? I, I, I mean, no. we have a full construction management plan. We've done mm -hmm. considerable work with the foundations. Why are we looking at something different now? Because the building above actually has changed in the interim. The actually the occupants of the building have been updated. The building itself uh, is enough different that they need to issue it. I just don't see how it interrelates here. Well, they, they, they definitely need to, it's enough different they need, they, they need a new building permit. Um, and these rows weren't laid out when this was done previously. So we're just going to what's, what's been submitted to ISD is radically different from what we had approved seven years ago. I, think, I don't even know. Six, five. I'm sure I can go look at it. Well, it's quite different than they just sitting up to Building-wise, but the foundation still remain, right? The, the, yes. What's in the ground will remain. Yeah. So I, I guess I'm just trying to figure out what, what, you know, understanding what ISD requires the new building permit, but how does this trigger these improvements that you need to get it six months advanced? It's really just uh, getting what we see as a prerequisite. Yeah, and I, I, so I think really it's not related. Really. Not, not directly. Construction-wise, this will happen. Okay. Okay, moving on. Um, the next row we well also on Western Avenue, we're establishing uh, a curb cut as part of the improvements that will serve the district energy facility. The district energy facility is within Harvard owned land. It's just a curb cut at this point in time. In the future there'll be a roadway network control extending down there, but we're not currently proposing it. Well, sticking to the specific repairs yes. on Western Pad. Since you are introducing maybe two new traffic signals within that space, within that limits, is it fair for me to say two? Just one right now. The yes. other one isn't there today? No, no. Not yet. I'm sorry. Don't for this one yet. Are those crossings spaced such that if, if traffic signals are needed, that you have structured your time space diagrams for bi directional traffic where you can give some level of coordination? Yes. It's designed to accommodate a traffic signal. Actually, when this intersection gets built and this intersection gets built, we're going to put in all the conflicts. That's what's my next question. So you will wrap the intersections yes. as part of the specific repair plan? Correct. Can you so put the we're interconnect about, on the plan? But since it was a, a, a not a non-standard installation, we didn't show our plan. We can update the plans to show Yeah, that. we just want to know where it is. Is really the yep. so you're saying academic way doesn't warrant a signal? Not currently. Not so just how does it warrant a crosswalk? Yes. Then? You have a four lane cross section. Yeah, there's a multi-use path uh, today that is along. This is uh, South Campus Drive. Which is built yep. Part of uh, the continuous project. That um, shaded path would, would be continued down and along the uh, eastern side of the street. Um, so at these locations we're talking about the rectangular rubbish and fire at the ends at those locations. Def definitely understand that, Joe, but you know, obviously if you're saying that there's going to be a future multi-path, I would consider yeah. that there, there's going to be a lot more pedestrians. Yeah. Was that factored in the warrant analysis? Yes, it was. I would still feel comfortable if you can put the underground subsurface hardware, because at the end of the day, once you are done with it, you will resurface the street, right. and then in a point in the future, we will not look too kindly if you have to cut it up to put the conduits. So it might be prudent for you to put the underground conduits so that way you can build the above ground infrastructure on the sidewalks without having to cut the street. And Don Burgess has looked at the analysis. He has. He concurs. Yes. Interesting. We'll put in extra conduits. Yeah. So, you know, I won't have awkward moments. Just put it in there, okay? Uh, one thing I think it's uh, something that uh, Joe brought up is important is that this includes a mixed use path called a wide bicycle and pedestrian path, which actually was established as part of Bears Corner and right the Smith Field. And we're all the way through the site and then connects to Arena Park, which was just completed. Um, 
probably three weeks ago. So this is once again providing the pedestrian and bicycle connection um, through this area where you can, I don't have to I, I think you said Thankfully, you said uh, adequate amount, but in the spirit of Vision Zero programs which the city had, let's try not to be reactive to a situation and be proactive and put the underground conduits. Yeah, okay? Yeah, that's no problem. Because early on in the design process, this goes back four or five years, when that was, crosswalk was being uh, proposed, basically, if it didn't make the warrant, I wanted the crosswalk removed. So, I don't know how we quite got here, so. The other thing is Western Avenue at Travis Street. We got another unsignalized uh, mid-block crossing. Um, hopefully it's because of the bus stop. Why wouldn't we move the bus stop down the academic way and get rid of that mid-block crosswalk? This bus stop. Yep, there's, uh, there's two uh, bus stops. Uh, so there's one right now that's in front of Swiss Bakers on this side, and then the other bus stop is located over here in front of the road. Uh, there's an existing crosswalk on the western side that would be relocated along with the So if I can echo Commissioner Hesper's thoughts, on Com Ave in front of BU, we continue to have challenges with the fact that the universities on both sides, students of a certain age bracket while walk talking with their cell phones, and you are creating a new environment here similar to that with a cross-through roadway where people actually want to go on Western Avenue, not to stay in this area. So you are, we are creating a situation. So take the necessary steps to manage the pedestrian safety aspect when you think about who you are going to populate this area. Students with cell phones, trying to cross a four-lane roadway. And as you know, we have that whole Vision Zero initiative, and it's a paramount. I mean, for the mayor right now, you know, pedestrian safety, cyclist safety, et cetera, is paramount. Yes. We just don't like the introduction of unsignalized crosswalks on a main arterial street that potentially are gonna have thousands of students, right? You give them, you give the student a false sense of security that they can step in to try and find a vehicle, a gap of however many seconds to cross while they have very little attention to crossing. Okay. We agree. So students are able to manage the situation without creating a yeah. situation for the city. And where it did leave warrants, that's what we felt it, it needed some sort of treatment is to identify this as a crossing, and that's why we had uh, proposed the, the beacons that would be there. So of the new roadways that are being proposed, these are private ways open to public travel, but we only maintained by the university. Uh, public uh, access rights. The first is Academic Way. Academic Way stretches from North Beacon Street across uh, West Avenue and down to Future Science Strauss. It provides a mixed use path on one side, a uh, standard sidewalk on the other. The mixed use path is bituminous that came out from our class of the VRA that the Civilian Commission gave us the thumbs up on that. So that's bituminous. As you approach intersections, there's changes in paving type to identify people that make the change in mm -hmm. this process. Uh, and then the remainder is either um, the chambers and um, the landscaping, it was the frontage zone along the street, and then a um, six to eight foot wide side on this. Is there an understanding between the university and the city that this street will forever remain as a private way open to public travel? and that you, the university, will not petition the city in the future to turn this thing to a public street. Is that understanding there? I think so, yeah. 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 And it will be written into our order. Thank you. The next row, okay, I should also note that we, the lighting out here, we work with the lighting department. The lighting in the south of the Grace Corner was a new style of lighting that we worked with the city using lights they already have and establishing here, we're continuing that on all these streets. So when you go from West and Ed to Academic Way, it will carry a lot of the same design back there, so you won't really feel it. Um, the next road is Summers Drive. It's one of the on the south side of the existing foundation. Uh, all these streets have water line, skeleton, water line, and drainage. Um, Summers Drive extends from 
we end up having to go up to what is currently called Rotterdam Street on this plan. Now, Rotterdam Street was a street that was laid out by the Mass Turnpike when they owned this site. Uh, it's not a named city of Boston street. So um, the plans, as you'll see them, have, a, have the third road, which is called Stadium Road. And Stadium Road starts at Western Avenue, extends down its new alignment, and then follows existing Rotterdam Street so that there is a public right of access all the way around the building. Because if we just tie it into Rotterdam Street, since it's not recognized in any way in the city street park, it doesn't provide us that preemptive to free access, which the fire department needs, which provides a complete public route. Is it a paper street? I know uh, it's it's not a city street. Never has been a city street. It was a state road that never came paper. over to the city, so it was a paper street. It functions like a driveway. They're going to be making it a private way through this action. But, but this should be very, and Joe knows this. Basically, it, it ties into Wyndham Street, which is the heart of the community. Yeah, that's right. It's very. You know, there's a lot of concern about truck traffic, general traffic, in inundating Wyndham Street. So I, I know over the years we work on plans to basically have a good signage plan to redirect any trucks that are prohibited from Wyndham Street on that off of Rotterdam. So I appreciate your help on that. Yeah, yeah, that's very important for the neighborhood yeah. and for us. And we've, you guys have been fantastic at helping us get that done. Thanks. Um, the only other things I probably want to touch on is a parking lot here, which we're not here to ask to ask the people mm -hmm. on, but it's a broader parking lot. This lot will serve this place. The street like that you're showing, mm -hmm. am I seeing it correctly where you have two arms, one for the road side and one for the sidewalk side? The street on this one? No, no, no. On, the, on Science Drive or any of those, the street like Yes, board. actually, that's part of the lighting program when they use the same concrete bolts the city uses and they put a fix a second luminaire on the sidewalk side. And the intention with that was to provide the city required lighting levels in the street, but provide additional um, lighting for the sidewalks. And you see also additional um, uh, fixtures at the crosswalks. So Are you introducing that fixture on the western and sidewalk improvements? So let me see if I. It's not being it. introduced, it exists today. They're adding to it. They're adding yeah. to it. Yes. So beyond your project limits, we will not see the second arm on western and? Yes, that is correct. We so have if put the neighbors on, start complaining to us, gee, how come we don't have it? How we, would you like us we to? We have these pedestrian lights because the neighbors because want it. Because the neighbors want it. So it is at the request. Yes. yes. Right. So we have other projects on Western Ave where we have added these. The double. Yeah, thanks. So that's it. I mean, those are the, the three new roadways, uh, the improvements on Western Avenue. Um, that's the whole ball of When you're all done, what will you do to Western Ave in terms of the road surface? You'll be cutting it up, chopping it up afterwards? It will be beautiful. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments by the commission? Now, we check uh, all of these roads and make sure that uh, the layouts will drain correctly so that uh, the company utilities will be uh, correct for new roadways and uh, they've all been approved. Well, two weeks, two weeks will be enough time to come back and respond to yeah, what was raised? Yes. yes. Great. All right, we'll see you on the public hearing on the 22nd then. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Third item of new business is 100 Sudbury Street, Boston proper, discontinuances, specific repairs, earth retention license on a set of petitions by Bullfinch Congress Holdings, LLC.
part of a company called the H1M Investment Group. We're here this morning to uh, talk to you about the uh, new project that we're taking on at the former Government Center Garage. We now call it Bullfinch Crossing. Uh, there are three specific uh, pieces that we're going to talk about. I'm going to give you uh, a brief summary of the project, but there are three specific pieces that we're going to talk about today. Uh, the first has to do with a group of discontinuances. Uh, my partner, Doug Mann, is going to talk about these. We have highway discontinuances as well as vertical discontinuances. Uh, we have specific repair plan uh, items that we're also going to present to you, as well as temporary earth support plans as well. Um, briefly, I just want to talk about the project. I'm joined up here at the table with, uh, with Dino DeFranzo, who's part of our, our project, Doug Manns, who's uh, my partner. I want to thank Amy and Todd. We've, we've coordinated very closely with, uh, with Amy and Todd to get to this day. We've tried very hard to make sure that everybody's very clear on what it is we're trying to do. This has been a long process for us. I think all of us on this side, as well as I think there's probably a lot of people in this building who are excited about the prospect of beginning the process of uh, demolishing and, uh, and rebuilding this, uh, this garage project. So if I could, uh, just a quick uh, few boards. Uh, this is the garage, you folks know it very well. Um, it is probably one of the ugliest buildings in Boston. Uh, in 2013, we completed with uh, the then BRA and now BPDA, uh, a PD, PDA uh, development plan approval project. Uh, I know this board is maybe hard to see from your, uh, from your piece, but essentially what the, what the PDA allows is for the addition of 2.3 million square feet of development uh, on the existing garage. Uh, there are a number of big pieces that are going to happen over time. Essentially, the 2.3 million square feet will play out in six buildings across the site. The first building and the one that we're going to talk about today is a residential building that's located here on this corner. This is the corner that's closest to the police station. Um, and we are prepared and ready to go on, on that project. I would just also add that um, the key pieces that we're going to talk about to you, to you today in terms of the pick actions have to do with this project. There are other pieces of pick action that we'll come back to, uh, to see you on. This is a, a phased project. So each building has a, a phase and a, a group of pick actions and a variety of public improvements related to it. But the first phase, the one that we're talking about today, is only this building, okay? Um, I get, want to just give you a quick sense of, as that building gets built, the improvements that really will, will uh, happen for all of us on New Sudbury Street. Um, we're so excited about this. As you can hopefully see from there, this is a total change from what exists there today. Um, this is the lobby of the residential building. This is a 482-foot tall building. Uh, we have uh, really been working hard on this for a long period of time. It's 486 units of residential. All the affordables will be located inside this building. And as you can see, the lobby is, um, for the first time since the late 1960s, uh, going to present a much more pedestrian friendly and much more interesting uh, presentation on uh, New Separate Street. So we're very excited about that. This is a different angle of, uh, of that same lobby um, here, just uh, a little bit further down on New Separate Street and looking back up toward the police station. And again, we're very excited to, to see that happen. And this is the, the building itself. Uh, the building is, is designed by CBT. Uh, you can see it's a, it's a beautiful building. It's going to be a nice addition to the skyline. I don't know that we're here today to talk about what's going to happen at the ground level. So if I could introduce Doug Manns, who's going to talk about uh, the specific pick actions that we're asking uh, for your consideration today. Thanks, Tom. Again, my name is Doug Manns. I'm with the Fund Investment Group. And so I have the more detailed plans that were submitted to the PIC Commission. Um, so just to give a step back, one of the unique circumstances of our project is that um, the project is an old urban renewal project. Um, and prior to that, so when the site was acquired, uh, we actually owned the center line of all the surrounding streets. So it's kind of a shared ownership right. Um, but again, what we're focused on is the um, WPD-1 or the residential tower of Bullfinch Crossing. This is where the police station is today. This is uh, Sunbury Street, which runs down here. And then um, Congress Street is right here. And this is actually where the garage goes over Congress Street um, right now currently. So we're talking specifically about this area here. Um, so the first two actions, we have a highway discontinuance, which literally follows the outline of the building here. And that's the first action that we're asking for. Um, so maybe take a step further back. As you might know, today, the existing condition is there is angled police parking right now on Sudbury Street from the police station down. As part of our approvals with BPDA, we've actually relocated those police parking into a new dedicated nest that's being built um, off of Boundary Street. There's actually a new half level now under the garage that's being constructed as we speak. 
Um, and so these 44, there's actually 44 police parking spaces. Most of them are here, but there's a few others that are around about where Hawk is. They're all going into here. That actually allows us to bump out the sidewalk and allows us to build this building with them begins to hide the garage, which is a key thing too as well. So let's get a little more detailed, but this residential tower will actually have single loaded residential units on the lower floor that will hide the garage behind it. Uh, one of the key things with the redevelopment over time is that the garage will be completely enclosed on three sides that remains on the uh, west side of uh, Congress Street, uh, which from our perspective is really important. So the garage will still exist in that condition, but be surrounded by new uses. So in order to do that, though, we do need a highway discontinuance that literally follows the area uh, of the building, and the sidewalk is pushed out into where the police park used to be on the street. And so that's kind of the first request. The second request just kind of piggybacks on it a little bit. A couple of portions of the buildings, it's vertical discontinuous, do hang over the sidewalk. There is a small area here and a small area here. If I go back to this, I'm sure this one's a good one. It's actually a really good way of looking at it. So this is showing you the small overhangs here and here. So again, the highway discontinuous was at the edge of the building. And the vertical discontinuous is in these two small areas. The building has these kind of three tiers that kind of jog down the street. So part of the architectural design. So that's the vertical discontinuous area. For the specific repair plan that we're looking for approval on, uh, basically we are looking at starting really just off the part of the police station. We are reconstructing all the way down and across the existing uh, garage and the subway street. And so we have the permanent labor streets, we have new street trees. Um, it is a continuous sidewalk all the way along. So today, right now, there is the existing garage exit on Sutbury Street that will stay, but it will be continuous concrete sidewalk across it as opposed to today right now there's a different pavement material. Um, we do have a future loading guide here as part of this building. Again, the sidewalk will continue across it. And even though the building stops here, we're carrying it all the way down almost to Congress Street so that we actually get uh, this ADA compliant to the Sutbury Street entrance. Um, so there's a lot of detail on this plan. Again, we submitted it um, as part of this project, not part of this section today, but we are also reconstructing the Falcon Green. Uh, so today, right now, there's a staircase only. We are actually putting in an ADA accessible ramp all the way down the street and a new set of stairs. We're also re-landscaping it. We'll be maintaining this uh, going forward in the future for the city of Boston. So some major work here. Again, we'll be back before you on some other items than that. Um, the last is the temporary uh, support that we're asking for, too, as well. So we are doing social pile and lagging. We are doing only a one-story basement here. It's only going down one level. So there is sold to file lagging just outside the building footprint here. And then we do also are doing a crane pad and a temporary hoist that will be uh, the right of way. It'll be removed. We are cutting off the, uh, the piles for that at 10 feet down uh, in the future as well, too. And so I think that's our presentation. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. Amy, that these continuances. Yes. Can you walk the commission members through how that conforms to our current policies? So we have the, the fees with the abutters. Um, so ultimately, uh, it would get appraised and they would pay for this. But because this is going to be a multi-phase project um, and they're going to ultimately be giving a lot of land back to the city, we want to wait to the end, figure out what the balance is, um, and we might come out on top. When might that end point be? Roughly how many years? Since this is a large, large project. Yeah, I think the project takes you know uh, between seven and ten years probably to, to build out. To, it is a large project. So the, the thought is that we will capture a lot of this when we address the removal of the garage over Congress Street, um, because there in that section a lot of land is coming back to the city, uh, and at that point we'll probably be running um, positive at this with, with land. Uh, and then they would only have to speak to anything that ran over that amount. So you're just talking about the vertical discontinuance, though, not, not the land. Correct, yeah. Right. So, like, uh, we're not going to make them pay right now because ultimately they're going to be giving us land in exchange instead of money. I would figure the land value would be a little bit better more than the uh, vertical. Right. 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 So, yes, we will be getting land back and they're getting air rights from us. So, in the end, we'll be coming out on time. No, but I, I'm talking about the vertical discontinuance of the garage over the current yes. Congress Street. Yeah, that's right, because th they actually own that heaven to hell. Yep. Howard, sorry, do you have anything to add in terms of details to what has been presented at this point in time? Uh, 
I don't. I think the specific repair plan is uh, vetted by a number of agencies. And some minor adjustments have been made in response to agency comments. And uh, it, as Tom described, you, know, you can see the benefits of it. How long will the crane pad be out there? Off, off, you know, approximately. So probably approximately 24 months. We're looking. So this building will take through. Um, will be complete in summer of 2020. It's a very tall building, so it's 480 feet tall, 486 units. So the crane will be out there probably for a good, you know, call it 20 to 24 months. So this, we should clarify, when you touch a crane pad, we're not talking like a tower crane. It's a, it's a crawler crane on dunnage. Well, that's, that's the first crane that's for the demolition part right. of this, but there is a tower crane that will be out there, and that's what um, this plant is showing, is that there's a tower crane. Again, it's within the work zone uh, that we're currently uh, using for the demolition of the enabling, so we're not in, increasing the work zone. Um, that, that's, we're going to talk about that. We're, we've got the approval for the original uh, demolition phase. Yep. We'll talk about the tower crane. Okay. Okay. Right. Correct. Separate this lead to the on ramp for 93 North right. on right, yeah. so it is uh, people using it. Just, just so you know, I mean, we've, we've, so, we've had numerous meetings, yes. and we've, we've actually in the last few months have made great progress, correct? So, uh, there's a, this project's really coming together quite well. Thank you. And I appreciate your team's uh, help in uh, keeping that uh, on track. Yep. No, thank, thank you, thank you, Eddie. Uh, there's been some back and forth with Gary Mosher and the engineer. Uh, and, uh, my message from Gary is that he's okay with everything. Yes, sir. All right. Can we have time for you guys to come back? Yes. All right. We'll see you on the 22nd. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much, you. everybody. Appreciate yeah. it. New business is 221 South Huntington Ave, Roxbury, an earth retention license on a joint petition by Eden Properties LLC and the Home for Aged Women Inc. I'm with Eden Properties. Um, we, in partnership with Samuels and Associates, are the developer of uh, 201 South Huntington and 221 South Huntington. Um, we're really excited about this project. We spent the last two years working with the Jamaica Plain community and the city to deliver on uh, the South Huntington guidelines, which was a five-year planning process. Um, that yielded new zoning for that corridor, which is changing from institutional to more residential. Um, and so this project uh, is, fits within the zoning um, and, uh, and delivers a significant community benefit, which is the uh, adaptive reuse and preservation of the Goddard House uh, building. Um, so it's a 168 unit um, project in two buildings. Uh, we're here today to talk about temporary or support uh, for the new building on the site. And uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, our team members here. Um, so we have Will Nichols from VHB, uh, Gary O'Neill from McPhail, uh, Nitty John from PCA, the architect, and John Erickson from McPhail as well. Um, we, uh, we're here at the end of our approvals process. We have Article 80 approval, um, the Parks Commission approval. The ZB, through the ZBA, we only needed a GPOD permit. And we have that approval, and we look forward to starting construction shortly. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Gary to talk about the uh, earth support. Okay, thank you. Gary, if you could be ever so kind. I don't have a photographic memory as to where 221 South Huntington is. What would be the closest major cross street yeah, roughly where about it? So, maybe. Biner. So, South Huntington and Biner is the, it's, it's, it's still, you know, about two, 200 feet away, I would say. Are we right across from Heath Street? Uh, no, Heath he Street is, is further down. For, th this site is basically right across the street from the new, the new VA garage. Uh, That's what I'm trying to get some context as to who your abutters are and. Uh, 
not great context because it's close up, but this is this is the existing building. Um, and so right across, so right next door is um, the Mount Pleasant home um, assisted living facility. And then on the, on the other side is Olmstead Place, which was the home for Little Wanderers building that was torn down and is now a uh, uh, apartment. That okay, so uh, this project entails uh, a low grade component to it. Huntington. It's about 170 feet along the street where we're going to need to put in some temporary first support and some rock bolting because the, the excavation, which varies from about 17 to 24 feet, Call a mixed face condition is a variable amount of fill, um, five to ten feet of fill over bedrock. So, uh, what we're proposing is a line of drilling soldier piles that would be uh, penetrated into the rock and they would be supported by one level of tie backs. And as I'll show you in, in some of these sections, there's going to be a bench, uh, bench excavation to line drill the rock that we can get to the excavation bottom and the building, this, this wall will be built with conventional double side forms. Uh, in terms of utilities, the key one that we focused on, it's difficult to see here, but there's a uh, sewer line, <coughs> excuse me, that runs in this direction. And as I'll show you in the sections, the, the tie back anchors are gonna be at least five feet below uh, that sewer. All the other utilities which are comprised Cable TV, electric, telephone, gas, water, they're all typical for So on this uh, board, we've drawn three sections, A, B, and C, and I'll just review those in three. So this section A illustrates the typical section the building. Here we're going to uh, ground surface to about elevation 87. We're going to be digging to about 70. Uh, we have about 8 feet of fill over bedrock. So there's going to be what we call a mixed face condition. Uh, so the procedure would be uh, to install the solar pile, excavate down, install this tie back anchor, which would be anchored in bedrock uh, several feet below the sewer. In order to make the excavation, we need to create a horizontal bench in the rock. We have a three-foot bench, and we're going to line drill this. And uh, to create that neat line, which is what we're proposing, to be five feet off the building, so that we can have space to do the double side forms. Um, we're anticipating that we may have to do some rock bolting to keep that rock mass in place, depending on the joint pattern. So common to all three sections, Drilled in soldier pile into the bedrock, one level of tie backs into the bedrock, well below the sewer, and within the rock cut, uh, two layers, uh, two rows of rock anchors, which will be a few determined. Uh, section uh, B, which is uh, at this side of the site, it's a similar condition except you know the rock is only five feet deep. Uh, it's a greater cut into rock, but we still have the same components of tie bags, rock anchors. And then finally, on section C, which is the uh, section taken to the center of the site. Uh, again, the same components, except we have about, uh, like about 14 feet of fill over the rock, less of a rock cut, uh, one row of rock holes we're anticipating, but again, the tie back anchored into rock and at least five feet below the sewer. In all cases, when the building is within, outside the property line, uh, all the earth support components are within the public line. Will you be coming back to us for a specific repair plan, Amy, later onwards, or are you going to redo the sidewalk as it is, since I'm going to assume that the work is going to disrupt the condition of the sidewalk? 
So the sidewalks adjacent to the site will be replaced in kind, so we don't intend to move forward with any streetscape modifications. Did this go through uh, the TAPA review? We're in the process. We're, we're right now looking at some of the comments from Bob D'Amico. So we're definitely uh, very close to getting approval, and uh, we're going to work closely with BTD to uh, make sure we... What's the mitigation that is being proposed in the TAPA? So there's some unregulated parking along South Huntington Ave we need to look at. There's a, a crosswalk that will be eradicated as part of this project. And also there are some uh, cantilever poles that are not currently used that will be removed as part of this process as well. But again... Those are the old MBTA. Yeah, the cantonary yes. poles. Yeah. So beyond that, everything will be, again, replaced in kind. The crosswalk is being removed, why? That oh, was that a BTD request, I believe. Yeah. So no one may be able to speak to that. So the, the reasoning was they felt like it was an unsafe crosswalk. So it exists now, um, but in fact it's not handicap accessible now, and there's no, it's not signalized at all, and so it's in the middle of South Huntington. And so when we went through the process, they request, we actually were going to rebuild it. We had proposed to rebuild it um, and make it accessible, um, but their preference was to remove it. Um, because there is, it's close enough to Biner, and then there's also another crosswalk um, basically 50 feet down that was just installed in front of Olmsted Place and the VA. Uh, and so it felt like it was just another, it was... Isn't, isn't there a bus stop right there? Th there, there is not. There used to be. Um, there's a bus stop across the street um, at the VA, and there is one uh, on, on this side of the street in front of Olmsted Place about 50 feet down, and that's where the crosswalk is. So it, it probably makes more sense for it to be where it is now. Right. But no problem. We'll, we'll touch base with Bob. And um, getting back to your sections, uh, I don't know if it's just a graphic illustration, or is there a need for the uh, real life defense of bedrock? Pardon? The, the, the graphic illustration that you have that shows quite a bit of brilliant from the bedrock. Yes. Uh, is that something that's required, or is it just I know what you say as needed, but I don't know if that you're going, how far you're going in. Or. Well, the bedrock is uh, what we call the rock street, rock street conglomerates. Uh, but any time uh, we're, we're going to line drill it, there'll be some hole ramming. We usually can break it out that way. But uh, when we make uh, cuts in rock, uh, we have to look at the joint pattern to see if there's any uh, adverse uh, joint patterns that would cause wedges to fall out. So, Feel at this point it's prudent to carry the possibility that we may need some rock bolts that to hold that mass together. I, mean, I was just thinking of the length of the tie back that you illustrated. But. Well, the, the issue actually, I'll, I'll just show you the other sections where the rock is, is shallow. So for here, uh, the soldier pile, the bottom of the soldier pile, stops above the bottom of the excavation. Uh, so there's a possibility that. With this being cropped, the soil pile being cropped at one location by the tie back, its other crop is by the toe embedded into the rock. So if this, if this rock in front of the toe is crappy, we need to secure that so that the bottom of the soil pile doesn't you know, kick into the excavation. So that's primarily the reasons. It's a, it's a dual reason for the rock, which one is to preserve the rock in front of the toe, and then overall to make sure this entire rock lot is stable. Yes, when the um, is there somebody from McPhail that's on the site when the contract is drilling these things? Um, I believe we'll be out here and we're monitoring vibration for the use of the soil pile. And then we're going to be involved in the construction process. To ensure that the angles of the tiebacks are correct? Oh, sure. We're going to be uh, out when the tiebacks will be installed and we're going to monitor the testing. I just want to make sure that the angles are correct so that the contractor doesn't uh, decide there's leeway for him to start drilling them a lot shallower. Right, well, the, uh, the contract documents place the responsibility of the design of the temporary or support on the contract to the submit a review process. So we, on uh, behalf of the owner, will have the opportunity to make sure that where they're proposing to put the tie backs. That, that's the trouble we find is that the contractor has the final say, it seems, and he has the right to change things, which then we don't see. Uh, and I don't know how we rectify that because if the contractor changes something and you approve it and it's not what we approved, how do we know that? Uh, one of the, the issues we've had as contractors, 
changing the design and the angle of the tiebacks and then drilling them right through sores and then filling the sores up with grout, which happened in a couple of places, and we're left with uh, a huge cost later on of replacing saw pipes that a contract has drilled holes through. And we're very, that's why we don't like tiebacks. Be only because, I, I know they're a, a good way out for people to drill them to, you know, it's a good you know, method of support. And they've been done very well in, in a lot of cases in the city, but we're very concerned of the fact that contractors then turn around and say, it's a little cheaper for me to change the angle on that thing. We, we will absolutely have McPhail out there. Uh, yeah, but I want to make sure that whatever the contractor submits is not something that changes, and if it is changes, they should be coming back here. Right. Or at least coming back to the inspectional services and, and to us and saying, we've, we've changed our our angles here because uh, it, it shouldn't be in that case. Uh, we're, we're, you know, we're sitting up here saying, oh, that angle looks fine for what we want, and why should anybody have the authority to come back after we vote it and then make a change that doesn't go through the Public Improvement Commission? Amy should get those plans, and she'll know how to distribute them. Because what we're doing, we're voting on your earth retention system, methodology and design. Well, so the, it shouldn't be changing. Well, the, uh There'll be a earth support specification in contract documents, and in that, in that specification, there'll be provisions that tell the contractor that the tiebacks have to be uh, the indicated distance below the sewer. And we have information on the inverse of the sewer from to from an upstream and downstream manhole, so you know, we assume it's. Kind of I appreciate the fact that you went out and surveyed it. That's up and, and, and didn't presume. In some cases, I've seen it. I see. Utilities marked as presumed, and that's that doesn't cut it in these type of things. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, also, the, you're showing a uh, Edison duct bank. Is that being supported in place? Are you relocating it? What, what are we doing with that? Here it's indicated to be relocated. I'm not privy to the specifics of that, but there is this duct bank that's within uh, our excavation area. So is. Eversource going to be submitting a grant allocation for relocating that? So there's a street lighting handhole within the sidewalk area. Well, that's the second question because you have street lighting conduit and handhole system right. in the sidewalk. So but the Eversource is I'm talking about right now. Why don't you look into that matter? So I don't have the Edison manual on the yeah, plan here. I know it's, it's, it's that's fine. Yeah, so it's, just check it. Make sure that the PIC staff is there. on the same page with you folks. It's make sure that it is not an issue right. at yeah, the public right. hearing. In this regards to that, I mean that's going to affect your, your construction management plan. How you're going to phase that? Do we have a construction management plan in the department? Yes, we. Uh, Cranshaw, the contractor, has submitted it. Um, and I believe we have some we have some comments um, that we're responding to. Any other comments? In two weeks, be enough time for you guys to answer some of these questions and come back. Absolutely, great. We'll see you on the twenty second. Thank you. Thank you. The fifth item of new business is Sleeper Street, uh, South Boston, specific repairs on a petition by the City of Boston Parks and Recreation Department. that is along Sleeper Street between the Children's Museum and Seaport Boulevard. And we are um, going to turn what is now a passive park into an inclusive playground in honor of Martin Richard. Um, we've been working a lot with the community and had three community meetings, which have been very successful, working with the Children's Museum and in collaboration with the Richard family. Uh, 
Uh, would you like to know more about the park or choose to be introduced to the admin? John Schmidt with Niche Engineering. Chris Donahue with MVVA, Landscape Architects. Uh, Chris is prepared to speak to the details of the park if the commission is interested in uh, hearing about that now, just a broad overview. Sure, sure, sure. Great. Sure. So it's just over an acre along uh, Sleeper Street. Um, on the left side of the plan is the Boston, see the edge of the Boston Children's Museum. On the right side of the plan is Seaport Boulevard. Um, and as, as Lauren mentioned, the park uh, is designed to be a fully accessible and inclusive playground in memory of Martin Richard. So all of the, the winding paths are in service of accessing multiple levels of play equipment without standard um, accessibility ramps. And, and it does that through a, a sort of meandering landscape uh, with many different types of custom play equipment. An interesting component of the park. John, John. 60,000 foot view. Roughly when is this work going to start and finish? I will start production by summer 2017. And finish in? We're thinking it's going to be approximately a year construction. Okay, so it's going to be next year. What's the condition of Sleeper Street? Uh, John, if you can give uh, offline, offline, let us know. Because basically what needs to happen is when the park opens, that the Sleeper Street is also in a palatable, acceptable way. I don't recall the condition of the sidewalks in front of your... Rough. That's... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's why we're here for this. Uh, an, an interesting component of this park is that it's actually a, uh, what we're calling it, a uh, utility building, maintenance building, will be under the park here. So the grading, people, people can walk in here and the slope comes up over the roof of the maintenance building through here, over a bridge, and then back around. Um, this here shows the building. Essentially, it's going to provide uh, storage for equipment. Uh, it's going to have uh, irrigation be served out of this building, that sort of thing. John, who is on the opposite side of your park, on Sleeper Street? Which developer, because the everything church? is the church. Yeah, the, uh, so we're right at the corner of uh, Seaport Boulevard, the church, which is we open the soon, it's right here, and then we have the, uh, the office building, which is right there. Essentially, we're here because we're, uh, well, we tend to improve this existing sidewalk. Uh, we are maintaining the existing curb line. What we adjust the curb to provide consistent six inch reveal. There will be some full uh, pan overlay of the street to resurface that. To oh, so you can do all of that? We're, in order for the curbing to work, we need to bring it to the center line, but we'll work with the city to expand that as necessary. Uh, the sidewalk will be reconstructed. We're having a small uh, street trees and a raised, raised planter bed here, 18 inches back from the curb line, a series of bikes, uh, bike racks here as well. And then this will be a dedicated uh, bus drop off for use of the uh, children's museum itself. That's an existing bus drop off with the same layout orientation as currently exists. Essentially, that's the gist of the application. Does the parks department have all the support it needs to make this thing happen? We believe we do. Financially and maintenance and all of it? We've got well of maintenance endowment, and in terms of the construction fundraising, we've actually um, got the majority of that done. Chris Cook's been working on that. Uh, and then there is some capital funding that's involved with it as well. Uh, Mr. Hedges' request, we submitted last week the parking time plan. I appreciate that, and yeah, they look very good, so Thank proceed you. as. And I'm assuming, I'm sure it is, that you all are working very closely with the museum. First Absolutely. lady who... Other comments on the commission? Two weeks good. You guys come back? Thank you very much. Great. Stay in 20 Sixth item of new business is Alfred Street to Dexter Street, Charlestown, a granted location on a petition by Light Tower Fiber Networks. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Dino DeFranzo with Light Tower Fiber Networks. I'm here with Sean Alves, the, uh, the engineer for the project that we're doing at Alfred Street. Uh, we have coordinated very closely with Amy, Todd, and Chung uh, on the project, and everything seems to be in order. I will let uh, Sean give you the details on the actual excavation. Uh, good morning. My name is Sean Ellis, Light Tower Fiber Networks. Um, oh, so you are with Light Tower, right? I'm with Light Tower. Yes. Suddenly, I didn't know you had a new job. <laughs> he wears a lot of hats. 
Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, Light Tower is seeking approval uh, to install two, uh, one four-inch conduit for Light Tower uh, on your drawing from Dexter Street across Alfred Street to uh, private property. Um, we will also be looking to install one four-inch city shadow conduit uh, running that same exact path from Dexter Street from a new Light Tower proposed manhole to private property. Uh, so, high in high so Alfred Street got rebuilt by the state. You know that, right? Yes. Right. Okay. So it is, and when we build, when we spend millions of dollars building streets of that nature, we desperately want it to last more than five years, even though the city has a five-year thing. So we spend close to about eight to ten million dollars between the cities of Everett and Boston to build that nice street. And the casino is going to be open just like I from eyesight from here. So, do you, how do you think we feel about you the, wanting to come? This project is actually for the casino. This is their construction trailer that we're hooking up. <laughs> Why do I get myself into this? <laughs> but, folks, we understand that you need to provide a service, sure. otherwise, stuff doesn't happen. But at the end of the day, this very nice street gets a little cut. And Dina, you heard this story yep. multiple times. So could you please speak to those who needs to be spoken when? to? To let them understand that we are trying to support their needs, but at the same time, the street gets used by many, and we are not overly thrilled by the cut, as long as you can make the cut disappear visually, and that doesn't mean a permanent patch that Absolutely. looks like a scar. Absolutely. It may need more than that. So if you can keep the door open, for someone to prove to the commission. Also, can we micromanage this? Is yes, I mean, take a, you know, pretend that it's a prison break and, you know, dig the blessed thing underground for all can I care. You we, yes. Do. Yeah. Okay. yeah, especially because if we're hooking up a trailer. I this is know. Not a, Hell up. Sorry for service. using that. But, you know, do an overhead connection for all I care. Yeah. No. Okay. We'll right, because the, the trucks we'll go the through there. Right. Okay. <laughs> but please be sensitive to the size of the. Scar. Absolutely. If the micro trench is preferable, he can do the micro trench. Right. That's fine, not a problem. Thank you, sir. So, once again, I'm going to ask the same question I ask all the time. So, you're showing a manhole. Yes. Where is the service coming from? The service is coming from, there's a, a uh, our Light Tower's existing backbone network yeah. is on, Dex on Dexter Street, which is about 50 feet up. You can see on your print, it's pole 312. Got it. How high is the pole? Uh, I believe it's 40 feet. You sure? Oh, overhead oh, connection oh, again? Sure. Yeah. Put another half pole on the other side. Want to add uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Do you know as long? Okay. Sure. You, you heard my speech. I mean, I hate to kill the air time by. Uh, your micro trench is. You send an inspector out there, and it's not done properly. They'll do it again. I give you, I give you my okay, make it as tiny as, okay. Yeah. Sure. All that investment was done for a specific reason. Yeah. All right. Completely understood. Thank you, sir. Other comments, questions by the commission? Hmm. All right, so I'll see you guys in two weeks. Right. Great, see you on the other side. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, new business, various back bay streets, Boston proper, Roxbury, grants of location on a set of petitions by Exodus Systems, Inc. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, for the record, Ricardo Souza from Prince Lobel Tie here on behalf of the petitioner, Exodus Systems. To my left is John Morrison from UCS Synergetics, the engineer of record. And furthest left is Paul Thurston, who's the project manager for Exodus Systems. And commissioners, this is a continuing petition to expand our wireless DAS network here in the city of Boston. It involves the um, seven wireless DAS nodes utilizing um, Boston streetlights pursuant to our franchise agreement. Um, the design of the streetlights themselves, um, and, and maybe I'll take a step back, one is located in the South End and has a certificate of appropriateness from the South End Landmarks District Commission. 
and the other six are in the Fenway district. And we've met extensively with the Fenway Civic Association over time. And as a result of various moves, we finally found um, locations that were acceptable to them and that were also acceptable to the DPW as well. In summary, Richard, how yes. many light poles and how many cutting? So uh, seven light poles and seven digs. And of the digs, uh, we decided to do almost half of them ut utilizing micro trenching, Commissioner Para. And the longest traditional cut is? The longest, tradi the longest traditional cut will be 79 feet. And which location might that be? And that will be location BBX EXP 080 in Fenway. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> We did street lights or intersection, of course. Westland Ave. You are going. Okay. Should be noted that BBX 95 is a DCR roadway. We don't approve DCR roadway. You got to go to them. For the record. So Commissioner Hesford, in addition to pick approval, you, we also need DCR approval for that? It's not ours. Okay. Be kind. Very good. Very good. We, we have worked with the DCR uh, before, so uh, we have a number of nodes with them, and I will reach out to their council relative to that node. Any other questions or comments? Two weeks' time works for you guys to come back? Yes, two weeks would be ample time. Perfect. All right, we'll see you all the 22nd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you, Commissioners. Have a good day. The eighth item of new business, uh, citywide adoption of a policy for the naming and renaming of public ways and private ways and the dedication of squares in the City of Boston on a petition by the City of Boston Public Improvement Commission. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chong Liu. I'm the legal counsel for this board. And uh, it brought to uh, our attention uh, in the last couple months, um, there are some issues with the current uh, PSC policy for street to naming and renaming to policy. Uh, just a little bit to background. This, um, the city's policy is a combination of both uh, state law and uh, city ordinance. And um, uh, the first time we adopt a comprehensive uniform policy is dated back in 2011. Uh, since then, a lot of issues come up. And we heard from the community, from our uh, engineers, from uh, the people who normally do business, and also the professionals like you folks. Uh, two issues come to mind. One is uh, how we change the name for the street without any abutters, because a lot of the city street has abutters, but a fair number of them don't have any abutters. Another is uh, square dedication. Square dedication is uh, just a plate on a pole, it has nothing to do with the street, has nothing to do with the street to address, um, but to somehow work in this kind of process. Uh, um, so to address those uh, two issues, uh, it's the first policy, the 2011 policy, we established a process to address that. It did his work, but we hear some to feedback about that. Uh, I'm just going to address uh, one at a time. Uh, for um, street without any butters, if we want to change the name, uh, which is very different from the street with butters, so who is qualified to petition to the commission? So. Uh, whether it's a third party or whatever, the butter, after some very extensive uh, conversation based on the recommendation we have from the, the engineers as a PIC, uh, so PIC as a commission should have the sole jurisdiction to address to that issue for the safety of, for the sake of public travel, the right of way to management and the public um, 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 to concern. For the square dedication, um, uh, we found out that most square to dedication is more a community process because square dedication has nothing to do with the street itself. And uh, so we refer that to the mayor's office of neighborhood to services. Of course, they have to consult with the PSC engineers, the chief engineers, the principal engineers. If we do find the square dedication has some 
relationship to the right away to management will refer to the PIC process for way to finding. So that simplified the process we had in the past is um, more effective for the community and also uh, more effective for the PIC to folks. That's the uh, two major two changes. We simplified the process uh, um, in a, to, to a number of ways. And uh, if commission have any two questions, uh, I will be here more than happy to answer them. Uh, if not, I urge the commission to mark up for public uh, to hearing. So I think I, I you know, and recently this has been going on. We've get, you know, a woman gave the testimony very emotional. Um, I didn't even want to bring up the issue about, you know, if it was a hero square already dedicated. I mean, I think if you go back through the eons, basically these squares are dedicated to veterans killed in action, men and women within the community. Sure. And basically, it was a way that the Veterans Commission would bring it forth to PIC to rename these squares after these uh, heroes. Yeah. So now, you know, as Amy knows, up uh, first question I ask is, it already dedicated to one of these individuals? Because I think we denigrate the memory of that, that individual by naming the square over to somebody that provided the ultimate sacrifice. Yeah, sure. So, so the way that after our conversations with veteran squares, um, veteran squares are handled purely by the Office of Veterans Affairs. Um, they are the ones who vet all the veterans and whether it gets a star or not the star. Um, in our conversations with them, they had no issue of a square being dedicated to somebody in the community. In addition to a veteran, they just want them on opposite post intersections. So, what was I, because that's, I'll, I'll get her that's name. a contradiction. I mean, over the 20, 30 years, I mean, they've been active in this process. So the, the, the issue that we were facing is that at this point now, almost all of our intersections have a veteran square of some uh, nature. And so there was no spot left for the community. So we did have a conversation with veteran squares about having them both. They wanted the sign for a dedication to look different from their hero square. And they didn't want it to be at the same corner. It could be on the other corner of the same but intersection. But don't we have a different, I mean, we have the veteran square, but we have a different category within like greenways, parkways, Etc. within the street naming book? So, the, the, right. so what we're saying right here is that if this is to honor a community member and you want to sign similar to a hero square just for somebody in the community, that that would go through the Mayor's Office of Sur Neighborhood Service. If we're talking about a post office square, a Kenmore square that's used for addressing or wayfinding, then that is going to be in still within the PIC process. So this is just if, if there's a community member who had done something and they want to commemorate them, they'll work with their counselor and the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Service on the small plaques and only the large squares and things that, you know, you we put up signs that say Kenmore or we address off of will still come here. But like the last one, not, not this one today, but the last one, we left it up to them how the sign design was going to be. It could be, it could be a, a huge... Yeah. Right. Yes. So, uh, and, if, and that's what we're hoping to standardize here, that the Mayor's Office Neighborhood Service will have a standard sign. If you want anything larger than that or bigger and better than that, you're going to have to come here to do it. Um, so this is going to be a standard sign, like a, a, a veteran sign will be standard. Oh, they're, uh, they're all standard. We, we right. So BTD has provided us with, um, for the couple that we did last year, a standard blue little sign that looks completely different from the veterans one that we were using. And we're hoping that the mayor's office will use that as their standard going forward because it represents about the same size and anything larger if you want a granite monument or if you want some sort of large wooden sign, you're still going to have to come Can in. you submit that as a recommendation by the PIC Commission to the Chief of Civic Engagement? Well, to address that issue to... They're going to ask us, we're going to verify that it doesn't need to come here and no, that no, it can no. go through their the process. The details of the sign, the sign. can be yes. given as a recommendation? Yes. Yeah, so, um, to address your question, yeah. to supplement what um, Chief Engineer and uh, Commissioner has for the point, in this policy, we specifically have the city to reserve the authority to approve the design of the play. Uh, they can't just say, well, I'm going to memorize that, so I can come up with whatever sign, whatever say we want to say. We specifically reserve the authority to approve to, uh, the design of the sign. Right. Part of this will get to standardization of the yeah. sign. Yeah. That so the mayor's office. We don't want to diminish the sacrifice. Oh, of course not. Secondly, basically, we don't want to process it. Joe Schmoe can come in here and he wants to name something after the new kids on the block or something. No. That it's that easy to do. No. Yes. You know?
So that's, that's why they yes. had to first consult with. The Not that I'm saying anything bad about the new kids on the block, but. Do we have more kids on the block? <laughs> so you, uh, do we have to vote on this thing, Amy? Uh, next hearing. Okay. So if, any comments that you have, we'll check with Veterans Affairs in the interim. And, and if we can actually have a conversation with the commissioner. Oh, right. Okay. Well, yes. No, no, the commissioner of the veteran, the gentleman, which is also. Yep. Absolutely. Maybe is that policy available somewhere? Absolutely. Uh, we'll get you a, a hard copy, and I can send you uh, it by a. Oh, perfect. Okay. Any other comments? Yeah, just, yeah, I just, is there a written document on this? Yes. It's in there. Yeah, it you should be in your, yeah, in your pile. Yeah. Okay. If not. At the, at the very bottom of your stack of plans. Okay. Awesome. Any other comments? Entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor? Thank you.